Welcome and thank you for joining us on At Issue. My name is H. Wayne Wilson. The largest minority group in America is the Latino population with 55 million of them in the United States. In the Tri-County area, 15,000 residents are Latino. So we'll have a conversation about the issues facing the Latino community with four individuals. Let me first introduce to you Betty Galindo. Betty is a resident of Peoria. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Also with us is Tiana Cervantes. And Tiana, you're with Knox College over in Galesburg? I am. Where you do? I am the director for Center for Intercultural Life. Um, today, probably, I would say that I would speak more as a resident of Galesburg and just with my experiences, not only working in higher education, but being a board member for the district. For the Galesburg School District. School District. Mm -hmm. And Deanna Ruby is here. Deanna is a student at Monmouth College, a resident of Peoria, and happens to be the daughter of Betty Galindo. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And also with us is the associate pastor at the First United Methodist Church in Peoria, Reverend Adrian Garcia. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, before we get started on some of the issues, uh, I'd like a clarification on whether it's more appropriate to use the term Latino or Hispanic. I would say you can use both. Um, doesn't matter for us. I think it is uh, more appropriate in the, in the current years to call people Latinos uh, in general. Um, I think they, use, they start using the Hispanics, uh, I say maybe 40 years ago, 30 years ago, something like that, because the census, um, and then now they are changing uh, to put Hispanic dash Latino, but uh, they had, the Hispanic has his own background and we are changing to Latino to be more inclusive with the Portuguese uh, speaking people. Because Brazilians are Portuguese speaking. Yes. So, uh, Latino appropriate? Um, for younger generations, we tend to prefer Latinx, which is a, a new term that's more gender inclusive. Um, and also younger generations tend to not like Hispanic just because it's, it was coined to us, um, but it also refers to our colonizers from Spain. And Latinx is spelled? L-A-T-I-N-X. Just to add X to the end of yes. Latin? Yes, okay. yes, instead of Latino, which is um, referring to male, um, male, the male population. Um, and I, I'd like to point out that, um, Betty, you were born in Mexico City? Yes, I was born in Mexico City. And you were born? In Mexico, in Mexico City. City. In Mexico City? Yes. And uh, Reverend uh, Garcia, you were born? In Monterrey, Mexico. Monterrey, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And now you have a, a longer uh, heritage here in America. I do. I do. Um, I was born actually in Galesburg, and um, through some of the work that my family in the local Galesburg um, Hispanic Latino community have done, um, I can, my, grand, my great grandfather actually migrated with the railroad um, back then CB and Q, now currently BNSF, um, to the Galesburg area in 1912. And Galesburg happens to be a manufacturing background, mm -hmm. big rail yard, yes. and has attracted many uh, Latin, do we say Latinxes or? <laughs> Latinx. Latinx, <laughs> just, uh, but uh, has attracted many. Yes. Uh, so I'd like to go around, just have a conversation around the table about what issues you see, and we'll start with Tiana, uh, what issues you see in terms of uh, th what's facing mm -hmm. the community? Well, I think that the issues facing the Latinx community are, are much the same as that are facing U.S. in general, right? So um, e economy, jobs, access to jobs, um, particularly in Knox County with the loss of manufacturing um, jobs in the mid-2000s, um, how do economies recover from that when you've been a manufacturing base? Um, in addition to that, then, how does education help support that shift? Um, and when you live in a state such as ours where budget issues have been consistent for at least a decade, if not longer, you have resources being taken, in my opinion, from education. So then it's a twofold, access to education, um, resources within education, depending on when you may have migrated to the U.S. So for someone like me who 
has been in the U.S. for generations, my family, language may not be a barrier for me in, in education, where for recent migrants to the community, that is still a barrier to education, whether that's K through 12 or higher. Um, but then as a population, if you don't have consistent work, you don't have a, access to education, then how are you then moving into higher ed? You know, our economy is moving and we're, in fact, um, I'd say pushing through the Obama administration access to higher education, whether that's community college or four-year institutions, yet the resources aren't there. So I don't think that the, the issues are any less different than what some would say, um, U.S. society or mainstream populations are facing. I just think that um, one of the issues that kind of complicates it a little bit differently is whether or not there's a language barrier. And, um, and then of course issues of discrimination because we're still not understanding um, the heterogeneous population that Latinx is, um, whether you're recent migrants or whether you are born and raised and um, what some would say assimilated or acculturated. I just think that um, it's expansive and it's complex and I think we need to, to recognize that and look at it in that way. I want to talk about discrimination in just a moment, but let's go back to this language issue. When you came to America, how long ago was that? It was about 18 years ago. Did you speak English? No, at all. So how did you go about learning English uh, as a second language? Like I say, for me, um, it was just a little bit of help with the Illinois Immigrant Council. They offer classes at that time, um, but it's only four months classes, and then you had to figure out by yourself, because after four months, you need to learn by yourself, because at that time, we didn't have any classes, ESL classes for adult people, and we still have a situation right now, you know, for immigrants who comes here, we don't have the opportunity to have ESL classes, uh, different schedules, because if you're thinking about a worker uh, who works eight hours a day, uh, they might have only time during the afternoons, but I don't see any programs right now running for ESL classes for workers mm -hmm. in the afternoon. So we really face a lot of discrimination and the word part is that you can express because nobody understands you, so. Uh, and ESL is English as a second language. Yes. Um, what are the top issues in your estimation? I would say that uh, the, the bad uh, publicity that we have through the media, mm -hmm. because the, the campaign from, uh, political campaign that is running right now, uh, they, uh, claim everybody who is uh, Latino uh, more like a illegal people, and it's not true. I think uh, it's not helping us to build our own families around the community. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not helping us because the discrimination is happening just because they, they, they hear the news, they see the news, and they say, oh, Latinos, and they just blank, they put whatever uh, quotation behind that. And I think, I think it's not helping us. I think. Um, that's, that, 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 don't begin this time uh, with the current political issues. I say uh, since the last administration, they started talking about the 11 million illegals in the United States, uh, trying to help them, but at the same time was not even solution and just spread the word that everyone is kind of illegal. It is not true. We'll talk about politics and we'll talk about discrimination in you know, just a yes. moment, but a, a, an opportunity for you to discuss. What do you consider the top one or two issues facing the Latinx community? Yeah, um, I definitely echo the sentiment of discrimination, um, at, not only in Peoria, but around the United States. Um, but I also want to mention the disproportionate number of representation of Latinx people, um, both in um, whether it be in the dentist office, uh, whether it be in high politics uh, or any institution, really, there is a lacking number of representation. Um, and it really does harm, especially the younger younger people, because you see people in these positions, but you can't see yourself because you don't see um, Latinx. Let's turn to your mother and, and you talk about that representation. The, the Friendship House in Peoria does have 
uh, some Latinos that yeah. work there that can help you. But when when you need assistance from an agency, an organization, is it difficult to find somebody who can relate to you uh, from the Latino point of view? Yeah, usually it's really hard to find any other places, you know, and like I said before, with the representation that we have in Friendship House, it's not enough for all the people and for all the questions we have. And we're talking about even, you know, regarding like the city of Peoria, what service they have, what we can do, where we can do. We don't have that program at all for Latinos. Uh, we really had to figure out by ourselves on sometimes even, you know, I don't have any position and people call me to give me a guide where they had to go and how they had to fix problems even in the, you know, in the band or anywhere. So because we don't have any, any representation that really covers all the areas or at least the basic areas like education, like medical, like, uh, you know, areas that you really need have more answers the questions that we have right now. And this can lead to discrimination, so let's turn the conversation to discrimination. Um, have you experienced discrimination in your 18 years here? Yeah, I have been, uh, been discriminated in many places. Even, you know, like I say, when I go to the schools, um, they don't uh, think that we can keep going educated after we are young or when go to the maybe um, dental office, they think that we we have to speak the language, otherwise they really discriminate us by the service they offer us, by the way they treat us, by the way they talk to us. Uh, they don't see us that we really deserve the service that they offer to the American people. So, let, I don't know. Let me turn to Tiana. Uh, you have been here for fourth generation, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And in fact, you do not speak Spanish. Spanish. Mm -mm. Have you, because of your appearance, have you experienced discrimination? Oh, yes. Um, I think that ultimately that's part of the problem with the current um, conversations in media, in, as Reverend said, in media, in the political realm, is that even, even someone who has been, who has lived in the United States and, and you could say has um, acculturated <laughs> to what we define as U.S. society, and, and that is also up for argument, what defines U.S. society, um, appearance matters. I remember being called a wetback in junior high um, and I didn't understand the term and I and I went home and I asked my father what that meant and as a matter of fact the the person who who threw that name at me actually had it wrong and called me a whale back and when I went home and and tried to explain to my father what had happened I, he just I mean he didn't know how to he didn't know how to respond he wanted to approach the kid and like no we're not gonna do that dad um, but then he actually explained to me that he was trying to call me a wetback, which implied that I had swum over the Rio Grande. And for my dad, it was it was everything that he had tried to fight against, right? He, My grandmother stopped speaking Spanish to him as a young child so that he could enter into the school system and not be discriminated against. Um, he, you know, he talked to us about, you know, blending in because from his, his point in his life, he felt that that would be the best opportunity for his kids would be if we were as American as possible. And, and that's just as damaging as to our sense of who we are. It took me a really long time to understand what it meant to be Mexican American. And there are still times where I question myself and what does it mean to be Mexican. And, and for a while there, I, I, I actually shunned Latino, I shunned Hispanic, and I wanted you to know that I am Mexican-American because of a multitude of reasons. My father's Mexican, my family migrated from Mexico, my mother is um, white, and, and so I'm a multitude of things and that creates who I am, but that's also what I argue the U.S. society is, and we don't accept that. We don't, we are still under this nomer, we're still under this impression that U.S and with all due respect to people who may be listening, we still think America is white, and it's not. 
And there are places for us who identify as Hispanic, Latinx, Mexican, Cuban, Venezuelan, who, whatever we define ourselves as, there's room for us at the table. But as Betsy said, we're not, we're not, we don't have the representation. But we define ourselves as being the melting pot. Well, that's a nice thought. But I, I would argue that we actually don't. Um, melting pot means that we're melting into one color. And when we don't acknowledge the differences, um, that we hold, then we're asking, our, we're asking people to erase a part of who they are, whether that's culture, whether that's language, whether that's, you know, and identity. I, I would like to add that when people call Latinos, um, many times they thought that it's just Mexican people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially in central Illinois, uh, because we have a heavy representation of Mexican people in the state of Illinois. But when you talk about Latinos, you talk about a multicultural right. mm -hmm. population. Doesn't mean even though we came from Mexico, now we are keep our Mexican heritage 100%. Right. We are to, as you say, the melting uh, uh, pot that we, we start getting on other cultures, you know, and, and adjusted to the culture in the United States. The same thing with the food, the, the, the music, the, everything is, is part of the game. That's why it's more than just one sector of the community. So a Costa Rican might have different issues from a Mexican, a Peruvian might have separate mm. issues, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, Diana, uh, Tiana mentioned that this blending and yet maintaining a culture. Uh, how do you balance all of that? Yeah, um, really quick, I did want to, I thought Pastor Adrian was going a different route. Um, I wanted to mention within the Latinx community, we also have Afro-Latinos, mm -hmm. you know, um, who may appear as African-Americans, but they're also Latinx. Um, but in reference to balancing, uh, for me, it has been difficult because growing up in the school, Peoria school system, oftentimes we are just taught uh, Amer American history. Um, and pertaining to that, it is really uh, white history, generally, aside from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, but being at Monmouth College, I think, has actually helped me uh, really get in, get closer to my roots. Um, I think that my parents did a phenomenal job in demonstrating what it meant to be Mexican. Um, and so growing up, I did have I did have the culture, and my parents taught me not to be ashamed of my culture, um, and so I'm really proud of that. But being at Monmouth College taught me that it is okay to be Mexican. I would say um, I think it wasn't until I encountered other students from like the Chicago area who have more experience and have. Um, bigger organizations, bigger groups, bigger mm -hmm. neighborhoods with um, our culture in it that they really taught me, um, I guess, the symbolism that it means to be Mexican. Um, they taught me how to further my pride and how to speak up on behalf of my culture. In, in, you, you, basically, you're talking about needing some role models. Oh, for uh, sure. That, that our history is white and black, mm -hmm. but really not Latinx. Mm. But that in, in, in our society changes very slowly, but we can mm -hmm. celebrate some things. Mm -hmm. Susana Martinez is the governor of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, Elena Soto, um, uh, uh, so, I'm sorry, Sonia Sotomayor mm -hmm. is on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Elena Ochoa is uh, the director of the Johnson Space Center, mm -hmm. a, a former astronaut mm -hmm. and now director of the Johnson right. Space Center. So there have been um, mm -hmm. inroads made, mm -hmm. uh, but still, when you, you talk about uh, your mother talked about going to the dentist and not having, sometimes, especially with dental language, it's difficult to communicate uh, with the dentist. Yeah. Um, I would say there, yes, uh, they are present. I, I actually didn't learn about Sonia Sotomayor until later because I'm into politics, but um, that's the thing though, growing up here, I guess there was no access to knowing who those people were, or know, knowing about them. Uh, we, you mentioned politics before. Let's talk about Donald Trump. <laughs> um, Donald Trump, no. I mean, he, he said, we're going to build a wall. Mexico is going to pay for it. We're going to ship 11 million people out of the country. How does that make you feel? Uh, I say feel awkward because I think mm. he's appealing to a, a, a group of people to, who doesn't want any 
I say in general Mexican people in their backyards. Mm -hmm. But I say this, that it's not true. It's not going to happen. It's just a something that he make make it up for gain some popula popularity. Um, I, I, I will say too, because uh, my wife is from the border of Laredo, Texas, and, and Nuevo Laredo. Um, living in the borders uh, right now, it's not easy for even for the people who lives in the borders to live there. There is a lot of issues. Uh, crossing the border, like they say, it is crossing illegally. It's not a easy thing for anybody. And, and no, in, in this time, time, I think the government is trying to, the Mexican government is trying to help their own people to keep the people in Mexico. Um, but not, nothing is going to uh, change anything. And, and, in fact, many of the Hispanics that we have in the United States, uh, the growing population is those who are, are born here, right. not to cross the border anymore. That happened 20 years ago. He's talking about the 20 years ago history, but it's not happening now. Betty, how did it make you feel when you heard Donald Trump uh, express that opinion? Well, it feels really sad that, you know, America tries to get that as a president because you, well, I think I don't have really good education. I still thinking that that is no uh, a normal thing to do. I mean, there is not happening. I don't think, you know, most of our people who are having their mind right, they can think that Donald Trump will do that because it's completely crazy to even thinking about it, so I won't support things like that. And, and Tiana, uh, what's your take on that, especially when you see, the, and, and granted, Mr. Trump handpicks, uh, his people handpick those crowds behind mm -hmm. him, but when you see those crowds cheering, mm -hmm. and you're, you're an American, yeah. four generations of American, mm -hmm. but what's your take when you see these crowds going, yeah, you know, we're going to ship uh, Mexicans back to Mexico? It's disheartening, it's sad, um, and, I, and I think what people fail to understand is that maybe the crowd, but those, those individuals go, and then they go back into their communities, and they have the confidence, they have the um, validation that saying things and thinking those things is, is something that is right. And um, I think that it it is unfortunate that we live in a time where people are so hopeless that we can so easily other an entire group of people that by 2035 will be the majority um, population. And to think because of the lack of representation that Diana said, there's not enough people counter, countering that argument. Because at the end of the day, as Reverend said, the majority of Hispanics, Latinx that are, that are living inside the U.S. are legal residents. Those that would be defined as undocumented, um, many whom I know, many whom I love, are not the stereotype that has pre been presented. Um, criminals or et cetera, et cetera. They are hardworking. They are here for the same reasons that Donald Trump's ancestors came here for, and that was a better opportunity. Let me turn to Deanna for a final thought with regard to, so what's next? What would you, if, if you had some authority, what would you suggest that we do to um, uh, have a, a more acceptance of the Latinx population? Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely think that there needs to be an increase in uh, representation. But aside from that, I think that the people um, like the mayor, Jim Artis, um, and anyone else right now has can reach out to the Latino community. Um, oftentimes, even their presence is important um, for us to know that we are accepted, you know, that we are noticed. Um, like my mother said, you know, there's kind of this erasure or an attempt of erasure of our community in Peoria. Um, we're kind of just put off to the side, but we need to be recognized. And I think moving forward, that's something that's really important that can be done, um, is that people recognize our community, that people come out with us and, you know, um, understand who we are and 
listen to our culture. And with that, we have run out of time. Uh, I hope that you continue the conversation at home. I'd like to say thank you to my guests for uh, the, uh, the insight, especially Latinx. This is the first time I've heard the term Latinx. So uh, let me say thank you to uh, mother and daughter, Betty Galindo and thank Deanna you. Ruby. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And also uh, Reverend Adrian Garcia, First United Methodist Church in Peoria, and Tianta Cervantes, who is with Knox College, and on the school board over in Galesburg. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the insight. Next week on At Issue, we'll be visiting with some individuals who um, grow marijuana legally. Uh, yes, medical marijuana will be the topic next time on At Issue. Please join us then. <laughs>